Good morning, I'm Stacy Thomas. I'm here with two of my grandkids. And I got to thinking about it this week. What will our kids think about the world at their age in this mask wearing world? When they ask the question, Daddy, what was life, life like before COVID? And how will they grow up? What is our reaction to all of this, everything that's going on? You stay tuned. Our reaction is even if, and we know he's able to do anything. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. Right now, right now I'm losing back. Stood on the stage night after night. Reminding the broken it'll be all right Right now, oh right now I just can't It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down What will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now I know you're able and I know you can Stay through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is you alone They say it only takes a little faith To move a mountain Good thing a little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, oh, give me the strength to be able to sing. It is well with my soul. I know you're able and I. Stay through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is you alone I know the sorrow and I know the hurt Would all go away if you just say the word But even if you don't My hope is you alone Praise God, Joe. You got me a little teary-eyed starting this thing. I want you to turn to Psalms 1, if you will. You know, it's amazing to me 
uh, whether it's Joe and Kim or Kim or whatever it is, it never fails for God to put in their minds and hearts the perfect song to sing for the sermon. And so, uh, no matter what happens, our hope is in God. Uh, with this whole COVID thing, with all that's going on in the world today, I want to address some of this because it appears to be 90% of the conversation, uh, whether you're waiting to get your oil changed or whether you're out standing in line for some place or whatever you might be doing at dinner, uh, waiting to, uh, for a table and somebody's sitting beside you. It seems to be the topic of conversation just about everywhere you go. And so I want to address this this morning, and I want to do this with Psalms 1, Psalms 2, and Psalms 3. And there's a reason for that, and you're going to see it. But before we do, I want to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus to take this service and this sermon in a particular way, God, in a very important way. Apply it to the hearts of those today whose world has been changed because of COVID. Some that have lost loved ones. Some that are trying to put their life back together. Some people that are trying to figure it out. Some people that are trying to decide, are they going to keep their job or they're not? Some people that are going through all kinds of turmoil because of all of the deliberations and changes that have come at light speed in the last two years. And Father, I pray your Holy Spirit will administer your word and your answers to their hearts and our hearts today in a way that only gives you glory and honor, for it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Psalms 1, I want to begin with it, and then I want to talk to you about, well, in fact, I'll read through Psalms 1 and 2, and then we'll talk about the big picture. Psalms 1, blessed is the man who, is, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But then he says, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And then he moves to Psalms 2. You know, the order of how things were put into the Bible, we believe, was just as inspired as the words of God. And although they were set there and put in place uh, by uh, the original uh, people that edited, put it in, in, into where the order that it's in now, still the preservation, we believe, was just as much a part of the inspiration process as the inspiration itself. So this order is very important. Right after this psalm comes Psalms 2. Now, this psalm here in Psalms 2 is probably the, I'd have to check that out, but I'm almost certain it's the most outside of Psalms 110. This and Psalms 110 are the most quoted in the New Testament. And there's a reason for that. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing, a useless thing? Hopeless thing. And the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. 
You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. I want to start with what is the big picture. The big picture of everything is the revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. This is the big picture. This is the, is what the Old Testament is all about. Prophetically, looking towards in every single thing in the Old Testament, whether it be in the offerings, whether it be in the feast, whether it be in the prototypes, whether it be in Joshua, whose name in the Hebrew is the same as Jesus in the Greek. All of this is a precursor, a looking forward to a prophetic way of bringing in the fulfillment that we bring in in the New Testament. And of course, Jesus is all through the New Testament. The principles there and the Gospels and then applied in the church and then the, uh, taught through Paul and the prophecy that's coming is all about the star player there is Jesus Christ in Revelation. The Bible is about none other than Jesus Christ. And all of world history centers on this person. He was what? Crucified before the ordination of the world. Preordained to suffer and die before the world was created was Christ. So he's the big picture. Well, the central point of man in all of this is very simple. Galatians 6, 7. What does it say? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You cannot break that principle. What a person sows, they reap. And it's all throughout life. Our choices have consequences. And we're going to see how that develops. But there's great news for that because somebody's saying, I made terrible choices over here, so obviously my consequences are over here. They're just disastrous. I have nothing to look forward to. It's doom and gloom. Well, the good news of the gospel is this. God gives us forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And that slate can be washed away. It can be removed from our past. Our choices can be changed. And the impossibility of living a life that's pleasing to God can be made possible by the fact that Jesus Christ comes inside of us and we have a new life, the life of Christ. And we live his life, not our life. Our life inspired, infiltrated, filled with Jesus Christ makes us everything that's pleasing to God. We're adopted into his family. We call him at that name that no other can call him other than Jesus Christ. And the fact that we're part of his family, co-laborers, brothers in Christ, we also call him Abba. The closest name you can get to daddy in the uh, Greek or Aramaic. And so we see this. But what is Psalms 1 about? Psalms 1 is simply about two ways to live. It's about choices. Choices made on biblical principles bring about certain ends, certain developments. And we know from the Bible this is what it teaches. Character determines our attitude and thinking. Our attitudes and thinking determine our choices. Our choices determine our destiny. And that's pretty much it. And so it's so important for us to have inside of us the word of God day and night. What does he say? His delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates day and night. What does it do? It causes him to prosper in everything he does. Does that say he'll have more money than anybody on the street? No, it doesn't say that. It says he'll prosper. He'll be a success. What is a success? A success is somebody who does the will of God in life and hears these words when he walks into heaven, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's a success. And so he says that this will enable us to be able to do that. But then he moves to Psalms 2. When he gives us two ways and two roads here in Psalms 1, and we could go on to that and dwell on that for a long time. But then he goes to Psalms 2 and he says, Why do the heathen rage or the nations rage? They plot and, and 
a hopeless thing. The impossibility and the futility that of human rebellion is a very stupid thing, he's saying. It's an impossibility. But what is history, the history of civilization about? The history of civiliz civilization is Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, the Grecian. It doesn't matter. Rome, all of them just total repeats of rebellion against God and all that happens in that. That's what history is. Man's rebellion against God. Man's trying to do it without God. Man trying to make himself happy apart from God. It's all, when you read most of philosophy, in my opinion, is simply that. How can I find truth and answers apart from God? How can I be happy and have the summum bonum of life, the highest good of life, apart from God? It's an impossibility. Because not only is it futile, to rebel against God as a nation or even as a uh, society or as a church or as a person, an individual. It is futile because the certainty of God's promises and plans of coming true is absolute. Here's what he's saying. How can you possibly, possibly rebel against God? He says, the Lord has declared the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Jesus Christ will be the supreme figure of all of the universe. It is a necessity. It is coming. It tells us that. There is no stopping that. It's coming. And so, when men try to do that, they simply remove their possibilities of happiness and human freedom in this world. But... In Psalms 2, it says something that gives me hope. He says here, with all of this that he's talked about with the Son of Jesus Christ, we could go into that, but verse 10, he says, Now, therefore, in light of this impossibility of rebelling against me, O kings, O leaders of the land, be instructed, you judges of the earth, you in political power, serve the Lord with fear. He's saying it's not over yet. God has not brought in the end of human choices because there's going to come a day that man won't be able to make those choices of evil anymore. Jesus Christ, Christ will reign, reign supreme with a rod of iron and nobody will be able to resist his authority and rule. That day is coming, but it's not there yet. He says, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, and change your behavior. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry. Do what is told you to do in the word of God. But then we come to Psalms 3, which is a living demonstration of these principles put into life. And I want to go over that. Now, I get a lot of um, YouTubes. And a lot of emails from people from different places about what's going on in the world. And a compilation of them is something that I want to bring to you now. And when I do that, I want to think about this for just a minute. As I gave the preface to the sermon, I started thinking about it. You know what I hear all the time is, when will life get back to normal? When will we get over this? When is this going to be in our rear view? When is this going to be past tense? And I got to thinking about the conversations I hear in my family with my sister and her daughter that's now in college and her, her daughter that's soon to be in college, and she's trying to make these choices. And, uh, you know, she said, I can sit in my dorm room and pay 15000 a semester and watch something virtually on television, or I can sit at home and work out a way to do this in another way. And it's, it's unbelievable, the conversations I hear. We go to a school graduation. It's on the ball field. You see, the chairs are six feet apart. And uh, there's no mingling after it's over. And all these kinds of instructions that have been given. It's unheard of. But imagine your kids coming to you, if this continues, ten years from now and saying, Daddy, what was a school prom like? What was a junior senior like? What were those dances like? What was the world before mask like? 
I uh, went to buy a chainsaw yesterday, and the ch same chainsaw, virtually the same, that I could have bought two years ago for $187 plus tax, I paid $440 for yesterday. And I asked the guy, I said, this is not, this is not right. He said, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I said, listen, this, a year and a half ago, I could have bought this for this. I was on the shelf. I, I wanted to do it, but I just didn't do it. He says, well, everything's doubled. And he said, some of it's more than that. <laughs> I said, this is robbery. He says, this is what we're having to charge. I'm sorry. This is it. Take it or leave it. And guess what? He only had one left on the shelf. That was pretty unbelievable. Well, when I got, I took a pressure washer, a surface cleaner, to the um, people this week, and I brought it in because it was broken. And I said to him, I said, uh, I need this fix. And he looked at it, and he says, oh, no, this is bad. I said, it's just a little wand. And the little wand underneath is broken off. He says, well, it'll be three months on getting that part. I said, three months on this part? I mean, you, surely you can get that part in a week or two. He said, you don't get it. Everything we order today is three months out. Two weeks ago, I went to the paint store, and I wanted to get a particular paint. He said, we haven't had that since April. Since April. I said, when are you going to get it? He said, we don't know if we'll ever get it again. And I started saying, you know, life has changed radically in the last year and a half. If it is true, and I'm going to give you this preface, because I don't want to be sued, and I don't want our church sued. So if I say, if it is true, I don't know that it's true. This may be totally fiction, but I want to give you some things here for just a moment. If it is true, what I've heard, that we've printed more money in the last year and a half to two years than we have in the previous 30 years without gold backing them, then it is inevitable that we'll have inflation at rates we never saw before. They'll come. There's no stopping it. It'll be like Germany when they used to take that wheelbarrow full of money and they'd go in and they'd take the money and they and they uh, I'm sorry they would sit there they'd go do something else and somebody would come up while they're looking the other way and they'd pour the money out and steal the wheelbarrow. The money was no good. I mean I, when I start thinking about that in in, in pre Nazi Germany and I start reading and from history the similarities it's scary. But let me go on. I read a lot of philosophy, used to uh, read a lot more than I do now, but if you've ever read Plato's Republic, and uh, you, you know, uh, Socrates, then Plato was his student, and you started looking at the similarities of, and I'll give you just a little small scenario. Here's what they did. They said, you know what? The common people, this democracy has led to chaos. We can't let the common people vote anymore. We've got to stop this. We've got to let the people, the intelligentsia, the philosophers run the country. So they figured out a way to do that. And so Plato wrote his Republic, which is that there will be certain what they call conditioners, planners, that will have certain people be in this job, certain people be here, certain people be there, and from birth they will order society a certain way where it will be the perfect state. That's what the republic's all about. As I read that, and I went back, read it again just oh, about six months ago because I saw so many similarities. I said, you know what, this is scary. But then if it is true what I saw and what I read that somebody sent me, that a, a meeting took place about 20 years ago with names I won't name, but trillionaires, billionaires, uh, entertainment celebrities, uh, NSA leaders, uh, top generals, admirals, pharma executives, chief executives of Save the Planet groups, top liberal scientists, virologists, geneticists. They met in this six-star hotel in London, so-called, and they planned the execution of a program according to the things that were sent to me, 
that would genetically alter the DNA of people to accomplish a purpose to bring about a super race in a new world order. But they said, in order for us to do this, we have to kill off a lot of people. And one of the leaders there, if I were to say his name, of course, you would have probably seen this in an in article because it was quite out there, said that the population must be reduced to 3 billion for us to survive. Now, I want you to think like one of these leaders that's sitting there saying, you know what, we're going to be heroes 100 years from now. Because if we're at 8 billion now, and in 20 years, we're going to be at 16 billion if that's what it would be. And if in 50 years, we're going to be at 30 to 40 billion natural resources, oil, water, food can't survive. Somebody has to take the bull by the horns. Somebody has to make a decision, a hard call, and do something that nobody will like, but that they'll applaud you for 100 years from now. So we've got to do what is unspeakable, but will be celebrated years from now. So we've got to come about, and we've got to invent a virus, and then we've got to invent a cure, and we've got to change society on the basis of that. Well, if you've ever read anything about how to change world order, this is a common maxim in that, a uh, principle that you don't get around. You have to create enough chaos so that people will accept new order based on the fact that you're giving them security that they've lost in the chaos. That's the way you produce it. And so I look around and I see what's happening and I start asking myself, if this is true, then we're living in the very last day. Now, I don't think Revelation has started. I don't think the ten nations of Europe have, have made their supremacy. I don't think the little horn has come up and that we've seen him. I don't think the Antichrist has made his scene yet. So like Psalms 2, there's still time. And that's what Psalms 3 is about. Prayer changes things. But not only in that meeting were these people there, according to what I read, there were also this new group called the New Atheist, leaders in that group. And their premise is that religion is not only irrational, it's extremely dangerous. In fact, the towers prove that. And we've got to make a new race that is minus this terrible danger to world peace and order. Now... Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? They say that man's incurably religious, so we'll just change enough about man that we can alter him so that he's no longer incurably religious, according to some of these things that I've seen. I don't know if that's real or not. I don't have a clue. But I'm not going to say that it's beyond the possibility of reality. But I want you to think about this for just a moment. What is my reaction supposed to be as a Christian to this? Well, had you been living in London during the days of 1941, 2, and perhaps even 3, you would have had your lights cut off by 6 o'clock. You would have had black curtains on your windows. And you would be praying that the Luftwaffe did not destroy your home that particular night. But it's not only that. You'd also be praying. And imagine this. You've got your children. You've got your uh, so-called making a living. You, you've got your normal life that has been totally erased from your memory. And you live day by day hoping to get enough food, hoping that you can keep your children close to you enough. And can you imagine your kids are getting a bath? And you're living with this continuous 
scare and total paranoia that the a siren's going to go off at any moment, and you've got to grab them out, get them in some clothes, and you've got to get to the bomb shelter before it fills up because once it filled up, it locked the door, and then you've got to find another one. And if you don't, you're left on the street. Now, you can look at the movies, and you can look at the actual footage, and you can see the wreckage of those days afterwards. But you didn't go to many funerals back then because they couldn't find all of the parts of the bodies of their loved ones that had been bombed. And the mortuary usually had been burned down, and so there was hardly anybody to, to be able to even take the body. That was London in World War II. Now, we're not living in the only time that the world's been in turmoil. There were Christians in. That are saying, what in the world do we do? Things will get better. Well, let's talk about that. They may get better temporarily. But what does scripture tell us? There in Matthew and Luke. Mark and certainly in Revelation. Daniel. Things are going to get measurably, progressively worse. We don't live with this utopia delusion that we're going to, you know, every time one of these environmentalists tries to say that uh, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can have this, we can save the planet and all this kind of stuff, what do they start by doing? As C.S. Lewis has noted, they start by trying to make earth heaven. <laughs> Good luck. They're not able to pull it off. Why? Because of human nature. God is the only hope of changing the DNA of anybody. <laughs> and that is through the Holy Spirit of taking that DNA and making a new person in Christ because you'll never change that old carnal nature that lives for self. Therefore, you're always going to have wars. You're always going to have conflict. And as man gets further away from God, you're going to have more wars and more conflict. And that's what the Bible says. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. Not better and better and better. So, could it be that we have kicked the ball and started it rolling of something that is going to develop much more speed as it goes down the hill of turmoil? So, we start thinking about, where are we? Well, and this is just my personal opinion, but I, I hear this uh, continuously. I'll say to somebody, they'll say to me, should, uh, should I get the vaccination or, or should I quit my job or, or should I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have perfect peace. And, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. That is, I believe everybody should have their personal choice of whether they take that or don't take that. But the compelling factor is now, all over the country that you don't even see footage of, which I just heard about somebody in Australia that got beat to death at a checkpoint by the police because of uh, not, not uh, being in his house at a certain time or something or being out or all these kind of things. This is really serious stuff. And so if I can't keep my job, that means that I can't provide for my family and ultimately I can't eat. And what does it say in Revelation? It says they couldn't buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Now, I personally do not believe this is the mark of the beast. It has, has, has no similarity, in my opinion, to the mark of the beast. But it's a harbinger. It is a precursor of what the mark of the beast is going to be like. Closer than we've ever been before of the government controlling your lifestyle and your ability to survive. Now, it's interesting to me because I was right there in, uh, the, in graduating from high school at Roe v. Wade when they made that decision and the cry of the feminist was this, my body is my property and I have choice to do with my body what I want. But that's not working with the vaccinations across the nation. You don't have that choice. Well, if you want to keep your job, that is. Now, what is it that, where are we in this? Well, <laughs> I'm 
I want you to know this, first of all. This is where we're going to go with David, here in Psalms 3. He, and I love the order, how the Holy Spirit put Psalms 3 right behind this. Because he is at one of the worst places in his entire life. His son Absalom has taken the throne. He has run out of his kingdom. He could very well lose his life. He could lose everything. And here is the way for us to respond to crisis. A crisis like this. He says, O Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. I guarantee if you're living today, you can say that. How they have increased that trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. We don't have to personally know who it is that's creating these things. But I promise you, there is a wave of resistance, and it's certainly against Christ. Against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. <laughs> no, I could park there for a long time, but... <laughs> When we go back and just, just look at that for a minute, he says, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? They want to set their own king up. And God says right here in verse 7, I have set my son as king. And what does he tell his son? Ask of me, son. And that's an indication of how we ought to pray. He says, I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Even though they're a guaranteed thing, he says to Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. They're coming, and they will be yours. <laughs> I tell you what, there's no verse in the Bible more powerful than 1 Corinthians 15.25. It is a cosmic necessity, for he must reign. He must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. God has sworn his son will reign until every enemy is subjugated under his feet. Nothing can change that. It is impossible to change that. God is in control, and it will be. As I said, if not one bird falls without his permission, I guarantee you he's in control. He's in control of everything. You were just singing this morning. You hit on a couple of things. God is in control, but God is good. What did Jesus say to that ruler that came up to him, that rich guy? And he said, he said, good teacher. He said, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, but God. And boy, was that ever truth. There's only one person that's infinitely and truly good in existence, and that is God himself. Now, he's the only good person on the universe. We have inherited good that comes from the Holy Spirit because we've been saved and we represent the life of Christ. But in our carnal nature, we can be just as bad as we can be. We can be like that little bitty baby I told you about. That one had the truck, and he had his truck, and he walked up to him. Instead of sharing truck, he conks him on the head and takes his truck. So he's got two trucks now. That's man. He wants both trucks, and you have no truck. <laughs> All right. Not only is he good, he is infinitely omniscient. Jesus is never going to say, boy, I made a mistake on that one. Imagine God saying, I wish I hadn't done that. With infinite perfect knowledge, he never misdiscerns anything. It is perfectly according to his will. But not only that, God is 100% faithful to his words. His promises will come true. The chances of you stopping that are not only slim and none, they're impossible. 2 Corinthians 3.8 says, For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 and 25. Then comes the end. 
when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and all power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Isaiah 14, 27. For the Lord hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? His hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? When Peter and James, had just, I mean, Peter and John had just been let out of prison, and they said, you don't speak anymore in this name, and they said, listen, we can't but help but speak what we've seen and heard. And then they go back, and I love what they say. They say, Lord, you are God, and you made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why did the nations rage? He goes back to this, and he's basically making the analogy, you guys that put him on the cross, you are the rulers that were trying to stop Jesus Christ, and he rose from the dead. You didn't stop him one iota. He's still going to be king of kings and lord of lords. Nothing was achieved by all of your resistance. You cannot stop him. He will come about. It's an impossibility. You know, I got to thinking about this in another way. It's like me having fun at Universal Studios in Disney World. Uh, that's an impossibility. Because I've been there. And I've been there with my little kids years ago. And uh, I, I started thinking about that in, in just a kind of a tongue-in-cheek way and said... Uh, standing on the surface of the sun and holding two ice cream cones while my wife takes the kids to do a ride over there and I watch them melt while I'm holding this little portable sauna for my nine-month-old who's sweating to death over here and crying uh, hysterically. And as I'm sitting there waiting for them and calling this fun, uh, and, and, and the little baby's thinking, uh, did you read the manual on baby dehydration? Uh, you need to go back to that because I don't think this is good for me. And, and, and so Ellen comes up. She says, what's wrong with her? What's, what's wrong with him? Why, why, why is he crying? I said, well, uh, I'm, I'm trying to do the blankets or whatever. I said, well, I think all the baby sweat's making him cold. <laughs> why don't we go over there and get a $20 burger and buy some more ice cream? This is turned to milk. Uh, so when I, when I think about the impossibility of me having fun at Universal Studios, I think about the impossibility of changing God taking over everything. It is totally under his control. I love history. Doug, Douglas MacArthur said when he was on Corregidor and his chief of staff said, you get out of here, the Japanese are going to take this place. President Roosevelt finally ordered him. He said, I can't resist his order. He finally, after three commands, left that place. But he didn't leave it without saying, I shall return. And he did. I guarantee you, this thing is going according to God's plan. But I want you to see. I want you to see how this developed in the life of David. He says, Lord, how they are increased that trouble me. Many that rise up against me. Many that save them. There's no hope for him and God. But I want you to listen, look at that word, Selah. <laughs> Selah. I love that. Because that word means a change in the tune of the music. It means we pause, we reflect. For just a minute, we change and move to a different kind of tune. It's as if there's been such a revelation of who God is and his faithfulness and his person and his appearance and his presence that we can't sing that same song. We've got to change it up and we've got to pause and celebrate his presence and just say, Selah, there now. What do you think of that? It's so powerful. Something changed inside of David. How did he do it? Well, let's look. He says, but you are a shield for me. Well, David knew his Old Testament. And if you turn, don't turn there, but uh, if you turn to Genesis 15, after this war, after the, uh, Abraham came back and tried to, well, he did. He fought off these five kings and uh, brought back Lot and all that. He says, after these, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, what does he say? 
Lord, O oh Yahweh, you are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I'm not going to keep my head down because the one with all power says you are my protective shield. You know what they'd already said? Listen, if you read Samuel where this is uh, taking place, he's already said most of the men, the great men in Israel, what he meant was the men of war are with your son Absalom. You're outnumbered, David. You better run for your life and you better not stop because he is coming to kill you. What did he say? He's already said Selah. But how does he, how does he bring this about? He reflects on God's previous faithfulness. You've been faithful to me in the past. He could have gone back to Goliath. He could have gone back to the six years that he was running from Saul. He could have gone back to all those battles that he fought and won. He could have gone back to so many things. But all of the past faithfulness of Almighty God is there with him. And he says, you didn't leave me then. You're not going to leave me now. And God's not going to leave you in the middle of COVID. He's not going to leave us in the middle of this thing. We're his children. He says, and he goes out and he says, I cried to the Lord my, with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Well, he's getting, <laughs> David is presently being run out of the holy hill. He's talking about Jerusalem, the tabernacle there. He's being run out of that place. But he's basically saying what Douglas MacArthur said, I shall return. Well, that is not likely. That is not probable, but it came true. He already had God's mindset. And then he said this, I laid down and slept. How do you sleep? I mean, how in the world did he go to a sound sleep with all of these soldiers coming down on him? He said, I woke, for the Lord sustained me. It was this assurance of divine mercy and God's ability to preserve him that caused him to be able to sleep. He said, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. I wish I could metabolically show you something. Uh, I read these articles by these doctors here a while back because I was going through a little stress. And it showed what stress does to your immune system. It showed how stress changes just about everything in your system to work against itself. It showed you how stress makes you a candidate for any likely disease. Well... I'm not trying to stress you out, but I want you to hear me... <laughs> He didn't have any stress. And he had every reason to have stress. Why did he not? Because he said, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. Why? Because he said, the Lord sustained me. He's done it in the past, and he'll do it again. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. You know what? You're God's people. I'm God's people. I'm his child. You're his child. We don't have to be afraid. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There is no reason for fear. 2 Timothy 1.12 For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. I've committed to him my children. I've committed to him my grandchildren. I've committed to him their future. I hear this all the time. Well, what's going to be the future of my grandchildren? I don't know, but God does. I don't know, but he's planning something for them because they're his, and he has a special plan for them. Does it mean it's all going to turn out according to my plan? It may not. 
but like Joe sang about. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said something so powerful. God is able to save us, but if he chooses not to, that's his business. Neither way are we going to serve your gods. We're not going to do it. I'm not going to serve fear. I'm not going to serve this feeling of despair about the future. I'm not going to do it. I'm only going to serve God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and praise you, Almighty God. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear. If it is true that all these things I've talked about fictionally are really true and have taken place and are set on the agenda, God, then may you have mercy on them as they try a very futile thing. Mercy on them as they seek to come into combat with God himself. Father, may you give us the grace to pray to a God who changes things because his children get on their knees, who can spare people who would have died because we get on our knees, who could bring a revival in by the grace of God because we get on our knees who could see this world not die and not live in fear, but come to God in a great revival that would just hush this up because of the obvious power of God. Father, that's what we pray for. That's what we want. That's what we live for. And we look to you to make it reality. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for hearing the message today. If you want to know more about Orchard Hills Church, I pray you'll go to Orchard Hills Church at orchardhillschurch.com. If there's any way we can minister to you on a greater level, please contact us. If you want more information about this message, other messages, or how we can minister to you, please contact us. May God bless you. And you have a great day. Now I can trade